Matt Green, CRO of Sales Assembly, all the way from Chicago. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? I'm good. I'm good, Wes. How about yourself? I'm good. So I'm um, glad we made some time here. You carved out of your busy schedule. You, you've got um, some cool software here. We're, we'll talk a little bit about it, but elevated learning and development for GTM teams. Go to market, account-based marketing. All right. Let's start there, shall we? We're going to get into your story in a little bit, but what the hell, man? GTM, ABM, it, isn't this just like a bunch of corporate speak for like, just be curious and just do a damn good job of being a salesperson? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot of acronyms to, to pack into a, into one website, right? It's all about the, the economy of words. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, you know, in, in its most simplistic form, um, that is what we do. We teach uh, B2B tech salespeople how to be better B2B tech salespeople and teach B2B tech uh, post-sales professionals how to be better at their roles, which, you know, you know, and, and you alluded to a moment ago, isn't the most complicated thing in the world. Um, simple, but not easy. That's why we exist. Yeah. Uh, so you you chose to focus on tech. Um, it, is it different? You know, is it different from selling uh, business insurance or commercial real estate? Yeah, the interesting question that there are, there are going to be a lot of similarities. I mean, I, I am a big believer as, you know, I don't want to make a presumption, maybe you are too, that by and large sales is sales. Um, the reason why we focused on tech and why we continue to focus on tech to this day, you know, six years after launching sales assembly is because when you take a look, just continuing with that thread of sales being sales, tech sales um, across the board, regardless of the product that you sell or who you sell it to is very similar. So whether you're selling a you know software solution to finance professionals, um, uh, technology professionals, sales professionals, whatever the case may be, you know, when you check under the hood and you look at how a lot of the organizations that we do, how they do this kind of stuff, it's pretty consistent from company to company. You know, the account executives need to be good at storytelling. The customer success managers need to be good at identifying upsell, cross-sell opportunities. So we saw so many more similarities just within the B2B tech ecosystem. That's really what prompted us to focus on this sp uh, specific segment of the market rather than just salespeople in general. Mm -hmm. um, you, you were in this space as a salesperson first, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, how did you make that famous pivot? Uh, I mean, launching a company uh, is hard. I mean, you've been at this what six years on your own? Yeah, yeah. July will be uh, July will be six years. All right. So 2017. So, like, walk me through that. Were your co-founder? Were y'all at the same company, or were y'all just friends? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. We had actually met serving on the board of the same charity. I think it was back in 2012, 2013. And when I joined a, a, an early stage uh, tech startup here in Chicago, uh, my partner, Jeff, was one of the first people that I brought on board uh, to help work um, alongside myself and the team there. Uh, so we worked together for about a year and a half. Um, our jobs were essentially to build sales teams across the country uh, for this company. Um, but then, like a lot of other individuals are experiencing today, you know, six, seven years later, we were impacted by a reduction in force at the company and found ourselves out of jobs. Um, you know, that in many ways, you know, of course, there's obviously a lot more to it, but in many ways, that was, you know, a big part of the genesis behind my partner, Jeff, coming up with the idea for sales assembly and us launching it back in 2017. So he got the idea. So, so there y'all are, right? Like in the Air Force, right? There it was. Yeah. Yeah. Got to do your hands, right? Um, you're out of work. It's it's 2016. Y'all had the idea. Yeah, yeah, right around there. And it took about a year to to launch. Yeah, there were a couple different iterations. You know, he and I we had kicked around a few ideas 
after finding ourselves um, again, you know, just unemployed and, and trying to figure out what the hell to to uh, to do, we knew that there were just given the experience that we had walked out of, we knew that there was an opportunity within B two B tech companies um, and specifically within the sales and go to market functions of B2B tech companies. So we kicked around, you know, one or two different ideas that never really got off the ground um, uh, prior to, uh, to launching sales assembly. But one of the things that we kept going back to and that my partner Jeff kept going back to is, you know, a, as we were trying to kick around some of these ideas, what we had done is set up a really informal bi-monthly coffee meeting with the heads of sales of what at the time were other early stage Chicago B2B tech companies, you know, companies like G2 or, or, or Sprout Social or, or Active Campaign companies that today in some cases are big publicly traded companies. And if not, they're doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue and, and have reached, you know, significant level of scale. But back then, you know, we were all just sales leaders at early stage companies and we would come together every other month and we would just chat about what we're working on and what we're struggling with in the capacity of our jobs. And it didn't take us long to realize that, again, regardless of the product that all these sales leaders to and who they, and who they sold it to, they were always complaining about the exact same stuff, right? You know, it was always a struggle to uh, find other peers of theirs to connect with. It was a struggle to train up their business development teams or their sales teams, you know, to the extent that they needed to. Um, so that, again, was another big genesis behind sales assembly, which today provides, you know, as we kind of alluded to before, skill development for the go-to-market teams, while also layering in a community for go-to-market professionals, both leaders and individual contributors to connect and collaborate and exchange ideas and best practices. So why is more training needed, right? We've got Sandler, we've got Miller Hyman, we've got Chet Holmes, we've got Zig Ziglar, yeah. We've got the challenger sale. We've got spin selling. I mean, come on, man. What did, can I just read a book? I, I mean, I can go to YouTube, right? I mean, Alex Formosi makes a lot of videos. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where, no, it's a great question. Believe it or not, it's one that, that we get a lot where we are going to be different in the market compared to some like challenger or Sam or Miller Hyman. Um, we don't deal with methodology, right? You know, challenger, they're going to come and they're going to set up like a sales process, right? You know, here's what you do to impact each of these stages as a prospect is going throughout, you know, the sales cycle. What sales assembly does is we handle what we like to believe is the stuff that, you know, might be simple, but is not easy, right? You know, training the account executives on how to be better storytellers or, you know, more effective negotiation tactics or training the frontline leaders on, hey, here's how you put somebody on a performance improvement plan in an appropriate manner, which is something if you're a leader, that's something that A, you're going to have to do at one point or another throughout your career. And B, is also something that probably in your history, in your career, no one has ever actually sat you down and taught you how to teach or taught you how to do. Right. So that's really where sales assembly comes into play is we're providing all the day to day skill development that all these companies, regardless of size, we work with small companies that go to market teams of 10, 15, 20 people. We work with big companies like Intuit and LinkedIn. And the common thread that connects all of these companies, regardless of size, is they know that they need to spend more of their time training their AEs on how to be better storytellers or training their CSMs on, you know, how to perform more effective QBRs, they just don't have time to do it. Why do they not have time to do it? Because they're spending their time building and implementing Challenger or training on, you know, the messaging around the new product that they rolled out. That's really the gap that sales assembly was built to fill in the market. So, because, yeah, I mean, you have a sales leader and they're juggling the CRM, they are probably fighting with marketing, uh, probably fighting with operations, probably fighting with finance. Uh, and they, they got some laggards on the sales team. They got some bulls in the China shop um, that are making it rain, but also bringing some pain with them. Um, so are are you kind of the, 
oh, what's the phrase? Kind of the the the, the thread, kind of to help them kind of pull all that together. Yeah, in a sense, I'd say that the best way to, to think about sales assembly and what we do is partnering with us is like adding a dozen instructional designers and sales enablement managers onto your team that can either, if you're a really small early stage company and you don't have sales enablement infrastructure in place, we can be that infrastructure. Right. Or if you're a larger company and you do have enablement infrastructure in place, we're just an extension of their team, because all we're doing over here day in and day out is just creating and facilitating training content that all these organizations either don't have the time or the inclination or in some cases, the expertise to do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to help piece this together, you know, folks that are listening because there, there's so many intangibles. You know, I always say I sit like if there's a Venn diagram of sales, marketing, and technology, like I sit right in the middle. I understand mm -hmm. sales. I understand marketing. I've sold CRMs now for 17 years, uh, used them for 23, 24 years at least. Um, but there are just having components. You know, like they say, you know, the, 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 what the, the sum or the whole is greater than the the sum, so, yeah. right? It's like bringing everything together, boom, makes makes it more better. Uh, but there's like a lot of silos in companies, yeah. right? Is that fair to say, Doc? Are you helping like bring the silos together? Yeah, in a sense, especially from a learning and development perspective because yeah you're exactly right um there are silos within company and the, those silos do extend to how much time and effort is placed on training and developing teams so what we see a lot of and i'm sure you you've probably seen this because this is pervasive across the ecosystem a lot of training a lot of effort built into onboarding new hires right you know you bring on board a you know a new cohort of sdrs or bdrs it's like great you know we got to make sure that these folks get up to speed you know, once they are sort of up to speed in air quotes, and it's like, okay, well, it's like out of sight, out of mind. I mean, they're already onboarded, right? And yeah, sure, you know, occasionally we'll, we'll reinforce Challenger or, or Sandler, whatever methodology we might adhere to. And yeah, we'll provide them product market training, right? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll teach them about, you know, this new feature benefit that, that we rolled out, but we're not necessarily going to improve their sales readiness, Right. That's where a lot of companies are kind of missing the mark. And again, when you talk about silos, not only just within the new business development team, but sales, post sales, revenue operations, sales enablement, individual contributors and leadership, the lack of focus on creating a culture of sales readiness and the byproduct of that is to your point earlier, VPs of sales, they spend their time, you know, um, live, you know, setting up the CRM and what else are they doing? Deal coaching. Right. You know, that's when they start spending their time and focus on actually coaching and training is like, no, well, we got to get this one deal over the finish line. You know, a big part of our thesis is making sure that organizations have the opportunity to make those investments in the front end on sales training so that that on the spot deal coaching becomes less and less of a requirement. Why is it less and less of a requirement? Because the sales teams are more effective at running the, the prospect through the sales cycle. So they don't need to bring in a VP of sales who just listened to the gong call and said like, hey, I got to get involved in this situation to make sure that this deal moves over the finish line. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is challenging, right? Because it's, I could see somebody that they need this, but a lot of times they don't realize they need it until they've lost a big deal, right? They've mm -hmm. gotten that bloodied nose. Uh, so A, they they missed revenue, but now it's like, now you're telling me I got to add another layer, another tool, more training. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you say to them if they're putting up those objections? Yeah, rather than saying, rather than thinking about this as adding uh, another tool, you know, what we are going to be a good solution for is making sure that companies have the opportunity to provide the learning and development that they need, which not only is going to help increase win rates, but also it's going to help retain staff, 
right? Because especially now, not to paint with broad brush strokes, but if you have a, a, a sales organization, it's going to be staffed by and large by millennial type talent. What are these folks most interested in from a motivation perspective? I mean, sure, money is going to be a big factor, but also, hey, is my company investing in me and my personal and professional development and success? So it is going to be a great solution to make sure that not only you're retaining the staff that you have, but you're making them more efficient. What is that going to do? It's going to make sure that you don't have the need to go out there and invest in more on the spot sales training, you know, by this or that or the other tool that might help, you know, um, increase, you know, motivation across the teams. You know, that again is where we're really going to lean in and, you know, us sales assembly, to be clear, we're not a software solution. You know, although we are a tech enabled platform, really what we're going to provide again is that day-to-day -day training and skill development that these companies know that they need and usually traditionally would have to try to build internally by adding headcount in order to do so by partnering with sales assembly don't have to do that so are are you weaving in like if they're a sandler shop or a miller hyman shop or whatever does that get incorporated or is it is it not even a thing it's more like an internal process is that you're helping them create. Yeah, it's uh, for us, it's not even going to be a thing. We are completely agnostic when it comes to the different methodologies. Again, the way that we look at this is methodology, of course, is just going to be the stages in the sales process, right? But the competencies that make a BDR effective, that make an account executive effective, that make an account manager effective. Those are, going to get, those are going to be consistent from B2B tech company to company. Those are going to be the competencies that we spend our time training on. So how much of sales assembly is, is like standard, like out of the box? If I go from company to company it's, and I log in, it's the same versus customizing for my company. Yeah, so it's going, we don't do any customization. Um, and, you know, we like to think that there's a big benefit there because the way that we deliver our training is going to be via one to many approach. So every week we're putting on as many as three live, you know, virtual, but live professionally facilitated skill development courses. Uh, just one example, about a week or two ago, we had a session that was built specifically for customer success managers and account managers on tactics that you could employ if your existing customers are ghosting you, right? So getting just hyper-specific, that type of situation. In that training session, we had 170, 180 CSMs and account managers from the 200 different companies that we work with. They were there having the opportunity to not only learn from a facilitator of that session, but also learn from each other, right? Because they're all there to learn about the solutions to the same problem because they're all dealing with the same problem day to day. So we give them that opportunity for that pure connectivity and collaboration so that again, they could exchange ideas and best practices in real time by weaving the community that we built of nearly 7,000 professionals across the 200 different companies that we work with into the structured training that we provide. That's what makes what we do much more impactful than you know, just a, a pre-canned, you know, on-demand session or coming in and doing something just for your specific company one time, and then backing away and saying, "Okay, Wes, well now you can take it from here." Right. So, but I mean, you'll take that training, like why are leads ghosting you, and and archive it, right? So if I join yeah. a company a year later, I could go review that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, but the the ongoing keeps it more timely, more relevant? Like, are you doing surveys? Like, how, how do you know what topics to address? Yeah, that, it's an interesting question. One of the other things that we do in addition to the training is we have monthly what we call peer group discussions. We have 15 different discussions every month. Uh, one discussion for VPs of sales and CROs, one discussion for BDRs and SDRs, another discussion for customer success leaders, so on and so forth. What these peer group discussions are is, again, really just a forum for these individuals across the companies that we work with to come together and exchange ideas and really talk about what's on their mind. What do we do at Sales Assembly? Because we're facilitating all these discussions every month, 
we're just gathering intel as far as what's timely from a topical perspective. So if we're, if we're overhearing through enough of these peer group discussions, like, hey, these two or three problems keep coming up, right? That informs us, we need to start building a resource or some type of content or training program that helps solves for this. Because if five companies are complaining about it, there's probably 50 or 100 that are actually dealing with it, right? That's what gives us the intel to constantly refresh the content that we provide so that, as you mentioned a moment ago, it's always timely and topical. It never becomes stale. Yeah. Do you have any turf wars, you know, like Bloods and the Crips in there? You know, you got Microsoft and Apple. I'm not, I'm not sharing anything because my arch nemesis is in the group. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've been asked that a couple times. There have been, it's interesting. There have been a few situations where there's been hesitation um, from some companies to get involved for that exact reason because their main competitor, you know, is also involved with sales assembly. What we found though, and that actually is really heartening, is that once you get, especially at the leadership level, once you get the, the VPs of sales or the CROs of these companies, you get them in a room together and it's not just them two, but there's, you know, 40, 50 of their counterparts all chatting with each other. They do actually end up playing really well together in the sandbox. You know, we have seen, you know, just an arch nemesis, you know, two people that, you know, even outwardly on social media might be going just head to head with each other. You get them in the room in a vulnerable environment when it's just them amongst their peers. You actually do see them saying like, hey, I know what you're doing. You know, we sell to the exact same product to the exact same demographic. Um, we tried that, didn't work for us. Maybe try putting this kind of spin on it and see how that works. So we actually have seen them again, play really well in the sandbox together. And I, th and I think that speaks to not only the strength of the B2B tech ecosystem as a whole, um, but just the fact that regardless of, you know, whether you're a small company or a big company, a lot of the leaders and individual contributors, of course, but the leaders especially, it's not like they have everything figured out, right? You know, they're constantly learning. They're constantly trying to source best practices and ideas. And they see a peer community like the one that we built as part of Sales Assembly. It's just a great value add, a great forum for them to be able to do that. Yeah. So what are some, uh, some timely topics you've recently covered? What are some, some little pearls of wisdom our listeners could pick up oh man um a lot of topics that that we've covered over the past quarter if you can imagine as you can imagine have revolved around um the efficiency of new logo sales teams um transitioning account executives from closers to maybe full cycle reps um expansion revenue it has been a big priority for essentially every company right now with new business kind of slowing down over the past couple quarters and then a lot of conversations around transitioning back to meeting clients and prospects in person which you know to old fogies like you and i it's like oh well that that's easy um what what yeah. you call me? what Oh, it's man, like, well, I got to end this thing. You, you and I both are what, you know, 30, <laughs> 30 31, right? Um, man, I'm going to be a grandpa next month. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you look great for, for 35. Oh, um, but uh, just the the opportunity, or I'm sorry, the, um, the this drive to meet people back yep. in person. You know, if, if you're a sales rep that has five, six years of experience, by and large, you've never really done things in person before. You know, right. Everything that you've right. done has been 30-minute Zoom increments. So training people up on you know, the fundamentals of God, like how do you host a happy hour mm -hmm. with three or four people for you know an hour and a half? Like stuff mm -hmm. like that that you and I, we probably have the muscle memory to go and execute that. A lot of these reps never had to do anything like that before. Right. How do you maintain the in-house expertise? I mean, it sounds like there could be a whole lot of topics coming up. Uh, and I mean, I, I can talk about a lot of things. I don't know if I can talk about three things a week yeah. <laughs> and uh, ongoing and add value. Uh, so how do, you, how do you maintain that level of excellence on so many different topics? Yeah, we're we're fortunate enough to not only have a really amazing 
team, you know, our, our product team uh, led by a woman named Alex Mislan is, uh, is fantastic, but we also have the opportunity to, to leverage the community that, uh, that we built. So yeah, I mean, facilitating three, four live training sessions every week, you know, not super scalable for a 14 person company, which we are, if we did want to build and facilitate everything in house, um, what we've done, what's made us successful over the past five or six years is leveraging other operators and subject matter experts in the space and the ecosystem that we exist in. So if we know that a sales, a customer success or a revenue leader from one of our member companies might be the best subject matter expert on XYZ topic, we'll collaborate with him or her so that they could develop the content and present it back to our community. And the benefit there is it adds a, an additional layer of credibility to the audience because they see someone who's representing an organization that has already uh, achieved a demonstrated level of success coming in and sharing what's worked for him and her, being able to say, not only here's how I built what I built, but more importantly, I'm still in the role. I'm an operator just like you. Here's what I'm planning on doing over the next three, four, five, six months as it relates to the topic at hand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so y'all you have a flat fee per company per year, right? Correct. Could, could a small business, you know, that's looking at Sandler or Miller Hyman, whatever, uh, and maybe they don't quite have a methodology, um, but you know, some of those trainings can be tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Could they, put that off and and maybe get what they need from your community and maybe form like develop their own methodology through being a member in your program versus doing both you see what i'm saying yeah while while again you know to be clear we're, we're not going to replace a methodology we we have sure. had a, a lot of our member companies do exactly that where they um have achieved, you know, again, a, a significant level of scale, maybe doing 50 to 100 million in revenue. And they have an uh, enablement leadership internally that says exactly that, like, look, I don't want to go out and pay six figures, you know, to bring in to implement this methodology. And then after it's implemented, have the people just like go away and say like, great, you know, you're on your own for now. I want to build my own methodology because I could piece together some of these components. I know what the best practices are. Hey, sales assembly, if you could provide the skill development, again, it ties into each of these components of the methodology that I'm going to build. Uh, we do see a lot of our member companies doing that rather than making such a significant investment in a Sandler or Miller Hyman or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so for those that, that may be, well, I, I guess kind of the same thing, same sort of question would be, um, I mean, there, there's big training around go-to-market and account-based marketing. And I mean, it's maybe it's the wrong term, but I mean, those are methodologies as well, right? Yeah. Um, um, methodologies are more strategies, right? You know, people will come up with organizations will come up with, you know, an ABM and account-based marketing strategy or an account-based sales strategy. Um, and that is also another area that we're not necessarily going to touch because again, we're not going to get too company specific. We're not going to come into your organization, diagnose, you know, what might be missing and say like, Hey, you need to build this kind of strategy. Again, what we're really going to focus on is, you know, those consistent threads that connect any go-to-market organization, regardless if you're primarily an inbound motion or an outbound motion? Do you have full cycle sales reps or a big team of BDR, SDR teams, and then the team of closers? Whatever the case may be, all those folks need to be proficient at their respective roles. And again, that's where sales assembly is going to be able to add some value. Right. Because so, I'm thinking along the lines of ABM and GTM, the same situation where somebody uh, is is at a decent run rate. Uh, they're trying to formalize some things. Um, I would imagine if somebody is a good student and shows up and engages in your community, they 
could start to pick up the pieces and parts that they need to to formulate their own methodologies um and and probably i'd imagine through networking you know somebody's probably hey look let me i'll share with you our plan you know and yeah. and they can so again you know hundred thousand dollars for big sales training over here fifty thousand dollars for some uh, acronym training over here you know versus yours being less than all of those they can probably start to put together their own as long as they're applying themselves i mean is that fair to say that yeah that is fair to say that's a benefit of not only what we do the nature what we do being ongoing in nature and perpetual it's not just one time it's not just hey let's build this and let's leave no it's week after week there's always something new that that, that we're offering that we built for the ecosystem of companies that uh, that we serve um and it's also a benefit of having uh, a, a really fantastic member success team here at Sales Assembly, dedicated headcount, where their whole job is to make sure that the companies that we work with, the individuals, both leaders and practitioners within the companies that, that uh, we work with, that they're getting all that they need through the Sales Assembly platform. Yeah. Um, so do you have like a trial or a demo or how do people get started? Yeah, so we uh, so while we don't offer trials, you know what we tend to do is, given the fact that what we you know our product, so to speak, is live training, right? You know, we want to make sure that folks have exposure to the quality of what we do. So we always like to lead with like, hey, you know, if if your biggest need right now within the organization is around your account management team, you know, great news because we're doing three to five sessions every week, we're always going to have something right around the corner. It's built specifically for account managers or account executives or frontline sales leaders. So we do like to make sure that people have some visibility into the deliverable that they can expect. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely being able to walk people through the tech enabled platform that we build as far as like, okay, if this was to make sense um, and if you vet the quality of our training, which we know is going to be top tier, here's how an organization like yours would actually be able to engage with sales assembly at the tactical level. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and it's just salesassembly.com, right? Yep. Yeah. Simple and straightforward. Very nice. So um, you mentioned recession or slowing economy, expansion revenue. Um, what is happening? What, 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 what's the advice you're giving your members uh, as we approach the midway point of 2023? Ooh. Um, I'm not one to, <laughs> um, I'm not one to, to give advice mainly because I think I, I don't be, I don't think it would be worth very much, um, <laughs> understanding that, that nobody has a, a crystal ball, right. And, you know, how, how are you going to be able to determine when the headwinds that we've been facing, um, might pivot back into tailwinds? You know, the one thing that, that I would recommend from a leadership perspective is just continue to be transparent with your team as far as the state of the business in general, um, what you've done, what you're doing, what you plan on doing, just give them that consistent visibility because with the, in the absence of visibility, if there's a vacuum of information, it's human nature for people to fill that vacuum with worst case scenario type of thinking. What does that lead to? Um, individual contributors on your team who you need producing at the highest level, spending a couple minutes looking around for jobs on LinkedIn, updating their resume just in case they're impacted by a reduction in force a few weeks or a month from now. So as long as you're able to provide some level of visibility as far as the health of the business to sort of assuage some of those fears right across the organization, that'd be one piece of advice I'd highly encourage leaders to take action on. Oh, you mean the ubiquitous uh, transparency, open and honest dialogue that everybody has on their mission statements and value statements on their conference room wall? Yep, actually living up to those. Yeah, that, it'd be, Damn. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> you mean walk the talk? Is that is yeah. that what you're saying? Yeah, who, who, who'd have thunk it, right? Oh, man, crazy. All right, good stuff. 
So Matt Green, co-founder, CRO, Sales Assembly. Thanks for coming on the show, man. It's been great. Thanks for having me, Russ. This was fun. All right, man. Have a good day. You too.